only by His grace. I have found this holy place underneath His wings of so love, trusting in my God above. Grace for every need, grace that overflows and far exceeds, lavished on my soul at Calvary, only by His studying the book of Zephaniah for the last two weeks. We are now at Zephaniah part 3, North, South, East, West. And our text is taken from Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 4 to 15. Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 4 to 15. Let us again read this responsively and I shall begin. Verse 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Akron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Caratites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. And the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and foes for flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon. In the houses of Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnify themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible unto them, 
for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, everyone from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. Ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, and destroy Assyria, and will make Nineveh a desolation, and dry like a wilderness. And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nations. Both the cormorant and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. Together, this is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How is she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you have called us to a battle against the enemy of our souls. The warfare rages on. The adversary presses on every side. Lord, without you by our side, we will fall. Thank you for providing armor for the battle. O oh Lord, impress upon our minds the absolute necessity of each of the six pieces, belts of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. Yes, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and which we will once again learn how to wield this afternoon. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A counsellor was pleading the case of his client who was accused of theft. The defence was not going well, so the counsellor attempted a different, more creative defence. All my client did was to insert his arm across the counter and into the cash register and remove a small sum of money. As a matter of fact, it was just his arm that committed this crime. My client's arm can hardly be seen as my client. I don't understand how you can punish the entire individual for a crime that was committed by a single limb. The judge saw through the flimsy defence immediately and gave the judgment accordingly. You have stated the dilemma well. So, by using your line of reasoning, I will sentence only the defendant's arm to one year of imprisonment. As a courtesy to the defendant, he may either accompany his arm or he may not, as he chooses. Upon completion of the judgment, the judge sat back in his chair with a smug smile on his face. He had played along with the counsellor's defence, but had still outsmarted him. The defendant and counsellor smiled as well. With the assistance of his counsellor, the defendant detached his artificial limb laid the criminal limb on the bench and left the courtroom a free man. Zephaniah mentions five nations for judgment in chapter 2 of the book of Zephaniah. We saw the judgment on one of the nations last week, Roman numeral 1, the judgment on the Philistines. The judgment on the Philistines. This is in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. We saw that four of the five chief cities of the Philistines were mentioned. They were perennial enemies of Israel and were called Karatites in chapter 2, verse 5. Namely, Cretans who lived in Palestine because they were related to the Greeks had gone to Canaan by way of the sea. 
along with the judgment on the Philistines comes a promise of restoration of Israel in chapter 2 verse 7. In that verse, Zephaniah says God will visit Judah and give them the Philistines' land. The word visit means intervene, and it tells of God's faithfulness to his people. We now move on to the judgment of the other nations. Roman numeral 2, the judgment on the Moabites and Ammonites. The judgment on the Moabites and Ammonites. And this is in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. The two nations of Moab and Ammon descended from Lot and his daughters. They will be judged because of how they treated Israel. Pride was another of their sins, chapter 2, verse 10. Their judgment would be as thorough as that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Their lands will become a wilderness, a place of wild thorns. But there is more to it. Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 9 reads, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah. Even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. What promise did God make in the last part of this verse regarding the lands of Moab and Ammon? God's people would possess the lands of Moab and Ammon. This is consistent with the promise of restoration of Israel in chapter 2, verse 7. Not only do we have the judgment on the Philistines, not only do we have the judgment on the Moabites and Ammonites, we have Roman numeral 3, the judgment on the Ethiopians. The judgment on the Ethiopians. This is in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 12. Ethiopia would be judged as well. Zephaniah did not say much about the land, nor did he give the reason for the judgment. He did say that the nation would die by the Lord's sword. Finally, we have Roman numeral 4, the judgment on the Assyrians. The judgment on the Assyrians. This is in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Like Nahum before him, Zephaniah predicted the downfall of Nineveh. Nineveh would be so utterly destroyed, she would become a dwelling place for wild animals. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 13 to 15 reads, And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation, and dry like a wilderness. And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nations. Both the cormorant and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in the heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How is she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his head. What did Nineveh think of itself? I am, and there is none beside me. Now, didn't God say, there is none beside me? I am the Lord, and there is none else, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 6? Yet Nineveh said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. When have you heard such a blatant disregard for God and a complete lack of fear of Him? A seventh 
century inscription from King Isa Hardin of Assyria states, I am powerful, I am omnipotent, I am a hero, I am gigantic, I am colossal. God judged Assyria for such an attitude. The book of Esther says that the Persian Empire had 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. This was a little more than 100 years after the time of Zephaniah. The prophecies that he told here concerning the nations of the Middle East were fulfilled prior to the Persian Empire. The Babylonians conquered the nations mentioned in the book and in turn, the Persians inherited them in her vast empire. The prophet spoke of the imminent overthrow of these nations by the Babylonians. These prophecies reaffirmed God's truthfulness and, and accuracy in revealing the future as well as his righteousness in judging nations. The judgment on the Philistines, the judgment on the Moabites and Ammonites, the judgment on the Ethiopians, and the judgment on the Assyrians. North, south, east, west. Whatever direction the prophet could look, he could see enemies of Judah which would themselves finally reap the judgment of God. Last week, we heard of the judgment upon the Philistine coastal cities to the south, which in sectional geographic terms, being on the coast was west of the kingdom of Judah, centered on Jerusalem. Today, our prophet highlights the three remaining points of the compass. To the east, there are Moab and Ammon, descendants of Lot who never ceased to plague the children of Israel. Moab was to be as Sodom and Ammon as Gomorrah. How meaningful were these warnings for these cities were not far from them to the west, lying buried under the Dead Sea. Then, to the south were the Ethiopians or Cush, the southernmost kingdom known to the Hebrews. Even to that extent was the sword of judgment of God to be felt. Finally, to the north, Assyria with its magnificent capital of Nineveh, which we considered in Nahum, was to be made a desolation, only fit to be inhabited by animals. North, south, east, west. What a, re what a wonderful reminder of the extent of the good news of the gospel. To the north, south, east and west, the gospel was to go. All points of the compass are represented by the amazed multitude in Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts confirms that the gospel was to go out in all directions. The far west to Rome and Spain, east to the Elamites, north to those places in Asia Minor, and south to Egypt, and even down to Ethiopia with the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. As the judgment of God is all extensive, so is the good news of the gospel, so that every tongue and tribe and nation, there will be those to praise the Lord eternally. From Greenland's icy mountains, from India's coral strand, where Africa's sunny fountains roll down their golden sand, from many an ancient river, from many a palmy plain, they call us to deliver their land from Arras chain. 
what though the spices, the spicy breezes, blow soft over Sir Lawrence Isle, though every prospect pleases, and only man is vile. In vain with lavish kindness, the gifts of God are strown. The heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. Shall we, whose souls are lighted with wisdom from on high, Shall we to man benighted the lamp of life deny? Salvation, O oh salvation, the joyful sound proclaim, till earth's remotest nation has learned Messiah's name. Waft, waft ye winds his story, and you ye waters roll, till like a sea of glory it spreads from pole to pole. Till all oh, our ransomed nature, the Lamb for sinners slain, Redeemer, King, Creator, in bliss returns to reign. Reginald Heber, 1783 to 1826. What are we doing to ensure that the gospel goes out? to the north, south, east, and west. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you have raised this work in the mission field. It is your work. There is a need for more workers and funds. Lord of the harvest, send forth those laborers whom you have prepared you know who they are. Supply also the needed funds through your people. Lord, move in the midst of your people and cause them to pray and go. If it is any one of us, Lord, send us. Make us your partners and fellow laborers in this great work. We also ask that you keep us ever vigilant this week, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance of saints. Help us to put all our trust and confidence in Jesus our Saviour and never in our own strength. It is in his name that we give thanks and pray. Amen. There is still one more part to study for the book of Zephaniah, which we will do so next week. Till then, worship has ended. The service has begun. <laughs>